So I had spent considerable time putting together Nicole and I's 10th anniversary trip. You ever been there? Like the big ones, 10, 20, 25, and uh, actually for us this year, it's 20. I know I look like I got married at 12, <laughs> but it'll be 20, but it was the 10 year anniversary trip. I really wanted to make it special and I, I game planned it out. We were living in Indiana and, and uh, I thought, you know what would be cool is the first part of this trip, we're gonna go back and visit those places where our journey started. I thought that would be cool on our 10th anniversary. So we went to Cincinnati where we met and uh, we went to all the, the, all the places, right? The place where we uh, first started talking, the first to where we had our first date, uh, first kiss, all that stuff, right? Planned it out, and uh, it was beautiful. And then the last part of the trip, we were going to come back down the Ohio River to Louisville. And uh, I had, had gotten a, a room at, at the Galt House. I don't know if you've ever driven through Louisville, but it's right on the river. It's, it's a really cool uh, place to stay. And kind of the capstone of this trip for me was uh, right off of the Galt House, right on the river, was uh, these riverboat cruises you could do. Right, you know what I'm talking about? I don't know if this was called the Bell of Louisville or something like that, and this big paddle boat, and you could go on a cruise. And so I had, I had researched it all out. I carefully planned, and I found out that they had these moonlight river cruises from like 11 at night to one in the morning. Isn't that cool? That was a good idea, right? Come on, a little credit. And so like, it was just going to be amazing, you know, finishing this trip before we head home and, and 11 to 1 on, on the river, and it was going to be so romantic, and you get the idea. So everything is going perfectly. We get down there about 10, 10, 15, 10, 30. We're excited. We, we uh, check in. We find our place, and we're kind of the early ones, but, you know, we're just like, uh, we're just enjoying this. We're looking forward to this couple hours, and um. I begin to notice people coming in. And um, this is a moonlight romantic cruise. And I started about 10.45 to, to start to have a little bit of mild anxiety because the people that were coming in were, um, they weren't necessarily couples per se. It was groups of people. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, I got, you know, whatever floats your boat here. Um, it floats your boat, see? <laughs> and, um, but also what continued to give me a little bit more anxiety was the way that they were dressed. I was born in 1979, so I don't remember the disco days of the 70s, but that's exactly how they were dressed. And I'm starting to, to feel a little bit anxious, like, uh... And sure enough, at 11 o'clock, some dude comes out in some, you know, leisure suit kind of thing. And uh, unbeknownst to me, it was disco night. <laughs> and for the next two hours, <laughs> I thought, well, we'll get out of the cabin, we'll go upstairs, surely speakers everywhere <laughs> disco music disco dancing and and honestly <laughs> this is what I've written down about that night that romantic moonlight cruise turned into a midnight fight for sanity <laughs> and today I want to talk about a topic as we walk through Ephesians that kind of is like that Relationships, um, <laughs> so often we're so well-intended and well-intentioned, and yet you and I both know that relationships can, can, uh, can be quite complex and turn into a lot of sanity, uh, insanity at times. Remember last week we finished with what um, I just kind of consider to be a key emphasis in the book of Ephesians. It's like 
This is who you are. This is what I've given to you. This is your identity. This is what it looks like to navigate life with this identity as a child of God. But remember that all of this is not possible unless you have come to a place in your life where you have abandoned your own self-sufficiency and realized that for me to live out God's purposes and plans in my life, that I need to adopt a lifestyle that is led by and controlled by the Holy Spirit in me. Uh, that's the only way this, this thing works. That God who has come into our lives in the person of the Holy Spirit as we have become his, his son or daughter, as we've become a, a child of God and we are in relationship with us, we come to the realization for this to truly work that not only does he need to be in my heart, but honestly he just needs to be Lord of my life. And that's why Paul writes these words and he actually makes not a suggestion, but it's an imperative. Listen, guys, you've got to get this, that if you ever want to live into what God has for you, you should be filled with the Spirit. And that word filled, it carries this idea of being controlled. Of all the things that I will say to you over um, uh, the ministry here, one of the most important concepts I can ever relate to you is this concept. The secret to your life in Christ is coming to a place where you have, f you have come to an end of I can and I can do it, I'll figure it out, I'll try harder, and you adopt a lifestyle of surrender and realize I cannot unless the Lord is in my life, controlling and leading my life. And whatever it is that I need to allow him to do that, either to get out of my own way or to something to get out of the way, the best thing I can do is come to a place that Paul says that he came to a point where he said, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. And so this is where he's kind of almost in a sense climaxed to and crescendo to, hey, I've shown you all of this, but make sure you get this. This is, this is what makes it go. This is the fuel, the energy for your walk with Christ, being filled with the Spirit. Look at how he flows then out of that in verse 19 of chapter 5. It's interesting to me that these couple verses that he follows with this momentous verse of being filled with the Spirit, he says things like speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's like as he is writing this and saying, listen, as you are energized by the Spirit, Spirit, as you are leaning into how God wants you to live, that God is always designed for his people to have two characteristics that mark their life. They are people marked by joy and people marked by gratitude. And guess what is some of the hardest things to maintain in, in my life? Am I any different than you? To be joyful and to be thankful, I, I, right? Like, holy cow, this is hard. This is so hard. And he's saying, listen, but one of the things that makes you different from a world that is dog eat dog, you know, run over your own grandma if you have to to get ahead, um, compare yourselves to one another, feel superior and make other people feel inferior. This whole world that is marked by so, so much of this stuff that the thing that sets us apart is a people that are consistently remaining joyful and thankful. Even when life is hard, and it's hard for all of us in a fallen world, there's randomness, there's injustices, there's, it rains on the just and the unjust, there's so many things. The best people in our lives get cancer, and the worst people in the world remain healthy and die at 90. Like the world is upside down. And the thing that is so crucial in showing the world that there is a greater reality is when we remain joyful and thankful. And he's saying, listen, you're not going to be able to do that 
unless the Holy Spirit is energizing your life. But it is so, not only for you, because the scriptures remind us that the joy of the Lord becomes our what? Our strength. The joy of the Lord is so necessary for all of us. It's what gives us the strength to navigate through circumstances and situations and, and, and difficult times. It's having that joy, and that joy comes from the Spirit of God energizing our lives. I mean, God, obviously, with, the, with, with uh, thankfulness and gratitude, I mean, what he's done in Christ should color every second of every day that we do, that we are loved by a God that gave him his own life for us. He's, he's given us this opportunity to know him. He, he sacrificed himself. And gratitude spills should spill out of the life, but it is only as we continue to be energized by the Holy Spirit. Look then how he then moves into relationships. He winds up this letter with relationships. And he's basically saying, listen, at this part of your life that is so primary and core and central to who we are, how we relate to one another, specifically our spouses and our kids, our families, our homes. He's basically saying, listen, you're gonna need the Holy Spirit filling your life for you to be able to live into what God has designed for these relationships together. I would say very clearly that the dysfunction of relationships that exists in our world and it is vast and varied and many and obvious is in direct is in direct correlation to the presence and person of the holy spirit being absent in our lives and so he says i want to talk to you about relationships in your identity of being in Christ, being a person that loves God and loves others, that sees himself as a part of something bigger than himself, that sees uh, himself as a child of God, created relational in nature, just as, the, as our God, Father, Spirit, and Son are relational in nature, as he created you that way, that you find your greatest fulfillment and meaning and purpose and enjoyment in life when you live in healthy relationships with one another. And he's saying, as I finish this book writing to you about relationships, I want you to remember that the Spirit is the one that's able to strengthen and energize you to do this. And this is how he asks us to live in relationship to one another. He says this in verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. <laughs> Submission is it's almost a curse word, is it not? How many love to hear the word submit? That's what I thought. Right? It's got a, it's a negative connotative word. Um, it, it's, uh, I mean, even in sports, you know, in the UFC, the way you win is you get your opponent to submit. That doesn't sound fun. That doesn't sound like anything I want to experience. What is this submissive word that he's calling us to? It's basically this taking on an identity that begins to believe in something that is bigger than me. I am willing to give up myself, so to speak, for the best of the we. Right? Like we get this in our modern era because we love sports. Sports are such a big part of our culture. And it's, it's so cool to watch a team come together. And in that team coming together, every player understanding that if we're going to win a championship, that there is a sense of where I put away some of myself for the betterment of the team. If you like music, and I, I played in some symphonic string and wind ensembles, like I think the trumpet's just amazing, right? But for us to make beautiful music, there were, there were obvious times or most of the time that I was called to play just some background 
melodies and harmonies, right? What, how ridiculous would it have been if every time I just started playing over everybody doing my own thing and always trying to play the, the lead line? That would not have been beautiful. It would have been terrible. Like we understand that to make beautiful music, there's a sense where we all find our place and let the music, right, you're following me today. That's the kind of idea of submission that Christ is calling us to, to be willing. This isn't some kind of, you know, have some negative self-image of yourself and, and downplay your abilities and, and have a, have a, have a, a, a bad uh, a, a picture of who you are, that that's godly. To No, that's not it at all. It's submission is being willing to give up certain rights if the team needs you to do something for the betterment of the team. And in the body of Christ and relationships, truly the way that relationships sing and work and thrive and are healthy is when we adopt a, I want to do what's best for you instead of a self-centered posture. Can I get an amen? Because every one of us knows what that is, right? Right? How good do your relationships work when you make it all about you, always about you? They don't, do they? They're terrible. They're dysfunctional. And that's why we live in a culture where, you know, half of our marriages are splitting. Uh, it's so much in this realm. I love what Paul said in Philippians, a a book after Ephesians. He says this, Rather in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. This is what it means to submit to one another out of the reverence of Christ. There is, I'm just going to tell you, standing here, there is no way in the world Chip Bullock can pull this off. I can't do it. I'm too willful. I'm too um, caught up in myself. I'm uh, I'm, I'm too convinced I'm right. I can't do it. I cannot do it. And without Christ, I did not do it. And guess what suffered? Authentic, life-giving, healthy relationships with others. Because I always got in the way. I can't do this. It was only when Christ came into my life, forgave me, gave me a new standing in Christ, gave me new life in Christ, and his Holy Spirit came in, and then I learned what it was to just let him now lead and be Lord of my life, that I began to be able to adopt a posture, a disposition of others before myself. I realize that in a, in a, in a culture of self-promotion and put yourself out there in your own brand and all that stuff, that this sounds very countercultural today. And for some, it's like, oh, this guy needs to shut up. Can I just tell you that the unlocking the abundant life for you that God has for you, to living into relationships that bring, that are life-giving, it absolutely calls you and I to change our posture from self-centered to other-centered. And as we live in that kind of community, you know what happens? It comes back. You get what you're looking for. You find this, this, this peace and this love and this joy that comes out of relationships where there's value toward one another. Submit to yourselves out of reverence. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You know, I've, I wanted to use this illustration last week, but this whole me trying to, to do this it's like, remember the old game of whack-a-mole? Do they still have whack-a-mole in the arcade? Do they even have arcades still? <laughs> it's disappointing. But um, remember whack-a-mole? 
Like you got the thing and you're hitting these, is it gophers or something? It's actually a violent game. Probably not, <laughs> not a good, but like, and like as soon as you get one, the object is to, you know, not let one. Honestly, trying to pull off the good Christian life without the Holy Spirit is like a game of whack-a-mole. It's just you're always, because without him, Lord, of your life, something else, your self-centered nature pops up. And you're just always, it's, it's exhausting. It's never-ending. It's terrible. It's miserable. And part of that is learning and, and, and adopting an others-centered instead of self-centered disposition. So he's kind of set the table. All relationships are led with others centered. And then he takes about 11 verses to talk about that one relationship that is primary on this earth for most of us. And so let me read the words for you today. I know some of you are going to squirm as soon as I start reading. That's okay. Listen to the words of Paul as he's talking about our identity in Christ and how it looks to live out God's purposes and plans for our life through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. He says, wives, there's that word again, right? But there's a, there's a reason why this word is used again because he just said, everyone submit. Why does he say wives submit? Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also husbands or wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own bodies, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does for the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Hallelujah! <laughs> Some of you are just waiting with bated breath to see how I'm going to navigate this, aren't you? I know you guys. Oh, we got on that one today. Because honestly, these three, verse 22 and 23 and 24, um, these verses, uh, especially given to wives, so often has been proclaimed from a pulpit by men. And this has been so misused. And there's a whole thing out there. That's why you're waiting to see what I'm about ready to say. Because it's really been... It's been tough, right? It's been misused. It's been used in ways that have been just plain out wrong. And as I'm navigating through this, because I'm, I'm trying to go to 6-9 today, I'm not going to sit here very long. I every year will preach a family series that's on marriage and parenting. It's coming in the fall. And we're going to spend some time walking through this. But today I just want to remind you that Paul writes in our relationships, especially with one another, he seems to identify the fact, uh, he's writing to people who honestly, you know, it's amusing to me that today kind of the picture of, of uh, for some in our culture of the church is, um, you know, has been chauvinistic and I'm just like, really, the rest of the world? Do you know how they treated women for thousands and thousands of years? Like Paul is writing to a, in a culture in Rome where women were not valued. Like they're, they're, it was unequal value. In fact, it's the church and the gospel of Jesus Christ that, that stopped that. The world was full of it. Still in today, in our world today, there are billions of people that subscribe to thought where women are not on equal value with men. That still exists in our world today, Right? 
And it's actually Paul writing something better. And it's, it's like, hey, I just want you to clue into something. He, this is the one who's proclaimed there is neither male nor female, Jew or Gentile. Like, we are equal. It's the gospel that was the beginning of the women's rights or women's equality movement. It's amusing to me that we get branded in certain ways because of verses like this that are misconstrued and misunderstood. But he's basically saying, okay, guys, in relationships, especially this one, just be realize that the tendency of uh, all relationships need this love and respect going back and forth with one another, right? Like, we need to feel love and we need to feel respected. And he's saying, I'm reminding you guys um, that especially you're this church that now says women have equal rights, and the, the culture around you is looking around, the Jews and the Romans are saying, what in the world? That's liberal. He said, I just want to remind you that in these relationships, that you continue to treat each other with love and respect. And he says, it seems like naturally that you don't need to tell women to love. They just love, right? Some of you are like, not my wife. But. <laughs> Right? Women are nurturing. They're loving. It's like Valentine's Day just is right down their alley. And we're sitting there looking at those cards like, oh my goodness, I don't know. I'm a little uncomfortable with all these. And women are just like, ah. <laughs> right? And he's saying women who naturally love, remember that it's important that you are, you're cognizant that your husband speaks a language that is a, a respect language. That's important to him. Like, uh, th there's a certain sense of a healthy, the healthy male ego. And he's saying, listen, that in proper life-giving, healthy relationships, especially that central cornerstone one, ladies, just remember to speak his language. Don't forget to speak his language. You're going to love him. I know that. But just don't forget to speak his language. And then he turns it around. And actually, if you look at this passage, there is considerable more instruction to men. And all the women said amen. <laughs> like, yeah, you gotta, gotta hear it. Once and twice and three times. He's saying, man, you, you speak this respect language, but you struggle to show love. Amen. I, I know I do. I mean, I, I feel, I sense it, I love, but it's, it's hard. That's why we have to be reminded about cards and chocolate and flowers and all that stuff. We speak respect language, but he's reminding them, hey, to live into the relationship that is bringing the most for both of you, you need to make sure that you speak her language, and that's love. You need to tenderly and carefully and sensitively love your wife. And especially in a culture in that day when it was ridiculous how men could treat women. I mean, you could just divorce them if they didn't cook the meal right. I guess you can still do that today if it's a little hard. You know, you know what I mean? Like it was okay. It was, it was like they couldn't vote. They didn't. And so it was easy for men to just... It seemed like it became a cultural thing for men to not value their wives. And as Paul is looking, I'm saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Really how God has designed for you to live is not what it looks like around you. But it's to love in such a way it's sacrificial. It's actually to think of them before you think of yourself. It's actually in a willingness to do whatever is necessary to meet their needs and to make them secure, and to know they're loved. As Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Amen? Amen? I want to tell you something. We have such a unique opportunity, even in our culture, where it seems like things have maybe overcorrected at times, and, and now there are, there are movements that are out of balance themselves, Right? Like, um, where there's always this battle in our culture for men or women, or it's the church that remains consistent and says, no, it's both. It's both equal. 
And actually, it's just trying to figure out how to speak the language that the other one receives and thrives in. That's all I have to say about that, (laughs) as Forrest Gump would say. I really am just going to stop there because I I really want to talk about the last thing. I just want to remind you that husbands love sacrificially, intentionally, and sensitively. Wives respect by trusting and encouraging. And I would say this, love and respect flow in a relationship that avoids criticizing, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. I've been married long enough that these words mean something to me. I know exactly what these words are, right? Oh, stop looking at me like I'm supposed to be perfect. (laughs) But seriously, that in this love and respect going back and forth and it's needed by both and yet being aware that, hey, they speak love. I need to make sure I lean into that. That one of those ways is to avoid these pitfalls of criticizing, not necessarily a complaint says a specific action. Like this is one for me. There is no gas in the car. I'm aggravated. Do you think that's ever been said to me? Yes. I love to run the car down to the last. That's a legitimate complaint. Criticism becomes, there's no gas in the car. You never remember anything. Criticizing begins to attack a person instead of an action. So often our relationships, criticism exists, and then it, it snowballs into contempt, this kind of behavior that communicates disgust, you know, sarcasm, name-calling, eye-rolling, hostile humor, condens- condescension. It's primarily transmitted through nonverbal behaviors. This kind of behavior in our relationships does not move toward reconciliation and inevitably increases the conflict. It's always disrespectful to one another. Then it becomes defensiveness. This, the problem is not me, it's you. I always know when I walk through, uh, through crisis with couples that when one gets to a point where they never see anything that they do, but it's always the other one, we're in serious trouble. Like relationships, love and respect flow when there is a, a willingness to own my junk. It might be 20%. In my case, it's always 80%, it seems like. You get what I mean? And then stonewalling, the deterioration in this relationship where you just start to like, you start to give up, you tune out, you begin to care less, you just disengage. He says, listen, let the Spirit enable you to lean into this most life-giving human relationship you can have. And in doing so, be aware, speak their language, give each other love and respect. But wives specifically, remember that um, your husband, he needs respect. He just, that's just how he is. That's how he's wired. And husbands, remember that your wives need to be loved and nurtured. And like, you might not be comfortable in that, but lean into it anyway. That's the language they thrive in. Nurture them. He says this as he continues on with the home. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. I don't even know what to say about this. It's kind of like, what else can you say? Right? Part of thriving in relationships are when kids recognize the authority of their parents. And even as a teenager, they can begin to live into a blessed life, a life that has promise. Isn't that what the command says? If you realize that, you know what? I'm gonna follow the rules they have for me, the guidance they have for me, the advice they have for me. 
It begins, the, it really, it becomes a blessed life when it starts in that way. I have teenagers, so I know that this is not as easy said as done, right? But he's like, hey, he even addresses kids here, children. In that culture, that's ridiculous. They didn't value children. Do you see how the gospel and Jesus Christ, there's value on every stage of life? Children, obey. And then he says this, fathers. Now this word fathers is, is, is also translated parents in other places in the New Testament. And so it's parents, in a sense, do not exasperate your children. Do not frustrate your children. But bring them up in the training and in the instruction of the Lord. Colossians says this, fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. It's this idea of kids will become, they will lose heart, they will be listless, spiritless, disinterested, sullen, a blank resignation toward life. And he's saying, listen, parents. Bring them up, but as you're bringing them up, he has this negative command, first of all, do not frustrate your children. As a parent now, I have realized that without the help of the Holy Spirit in my life, that I can't do this. That I become a little bit about me. I wanted my kid to do that. I want it, you know what I mean? And so often I can frustrate my kids or I can, I don't wanna say so often, but I can frustrate my kids when I lose a sense of being the person God wants me to be and I slip back into the self-centered kind of thing. I, I would just remind you of ways that we can frustrate your kids. Obviously, abuse. Abuse. I was thinking about this, the tone of voice, the overreaction. Have you ever done this with your, how many of you have a dog? I probably shouldn't admit this because it's a little bit of a, a, an exercise that probably Nellie didn't appreciate. That's the name of our dog, Nellie. But dogs don't understand human language, right? But they totally understand tone. So I've actually tried this before on our dog. I'll be like, in a sweet voice, or in a, in a harsh voice, I'll be like, Nellie, I love you so much. You're the greatest dog in the world. And I'm saying these great things, but my tone of voice is like this. And then I'll look at her and say, Nellie, I'm going to take you to the pound today. <laughs> oh, Nellie, I hate you. You're so... And she's just like, you know, like. What I'm trying to say is our tone matters a whole lot. Our kids even early on are looking at our tone before they are understanding our language. And abuse, honestly, again, we frustrate our kids when we overreact. Overprotectionism, favoritism, parents that push achievement this is, this is a huge one, neglect or discouraging words. But he says, bring them up. Don't frustrate them, but bring them up. This word is, a, it's a nourishing kind of word. It's, a, it's, a, it's the same word used when he talks about how uh, men should treat their wives and, and a wife or a husband loves and cares for his own body as he does his wife, um, so he should do this with kids. It's a nourishment kind of word. It's a love kind of word, a nurture and tenderly develop them, bring them up. It's this idea of a holistic approach to the health and well-being of your child. It's loving them. It's, it's this idea of, uh, let, me, let me find it here because it was really good in my notes. It's, it's, it's bringing them up, nurturing them, and giving them what they need from a source of love. A ch it's, it's this idea of a child with a full love tank can respond to parental guidance without resentment. It's this kind of ability as a parent to accept their uniqueness completely, to affirm their value constantly, and to love them fiercely. 
It's this idea that as you are training them and instructing them and bringing them up, that the unconditional love that you lead with prevents the problems of resentment, feelings of being unloved, guilt, fear, and insecurity. It's in the context of this, and this is where we absolutely need the help of the Holy Spirit to nurture our kids. He says, bring them up in the discipline, the instruction, the training of the Lord. This word training is the discipline word. It's it's teaching them self-control and the ability to restore restrained from personal desires in order to do what's right. It's a train, correct, cultivate, and educate. One thing I would want to remind you today, though, is is an understanding from Scripture that all of our kids are born with hearts that need to be set right. Amen? Psalm says that David said, and I was conceived in iniquity, and it wasn't, you know, that he was born out of wedlock. It was like I was born with a sinful nature. Each of us have. And parenting is always parenting toward the heart, not toward the behavior first. Amen? Ooh. It's 10, 12. I'm done. <laughs> to be finished. I want to finish with that. So often in a in a appearance driven culture and world in a world that values talent and achievement so much that so often our parenting we set our goals based on behaviors and accomplishments and achievements And yet parenting has always been, first of all, to the heart. That my kid might fail in a behavior, but I can sense that their heart is being more tender. Are you following what I'm saying? This is bringing them up. It's, sure, I I mean, I grew up old school, believe in, you know, like, Behavior matters, okay? Not trying to say that. But I'm saying that like as we are training our kids, we're first of all interested in their heart before they are perfectly behaving in certain ways. That our focus should always be on the heart first before behavior. Father, I pray today, uh, obviously we're just gonna have to continue with this next week, that you would, would continue to speak to us Lord, in our relationships uh, of marriage, in our parenting, these are huge things. And Lord, I don't, we don't want to mess it up. We don't want to cause dysfunction. We don't want to live um, in dysfunction. We don't want to live well below what you've called us to. And Lord, as you've talked about this, you've told us that the thing that's necessary is that the Holy Spirit is energizing your life so then you can be this spouse that's life-giving and this having this healthy marriage so that you can then be a parent who, who parents toward the heart, who brings up their kids in a nurturing, loving environment that gives them the tools necessary to navigate how to become a, a person who is responsible and who loves you and follows your will for their life. Lord, teach us how to do this and help us to see that we're never we're supposed to do this on our own. In fact, when we get in our own strength, we will fail and we'll have regrets so often. And yet you've promised that you would help us in these ways. Bless this time, bless these people, and bless us this week as we go out into our world in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. amen. Thank you.